All right, I'm recording. Welcome everyone to Qualia Structure Journal Club number four with Nicolo, myself, Ariel, and this time we are lucky to have Professor Natsugu Tsuchiya with us. Um, so to remind everyone, the purpose of this journal club is to try and understand and explore the like Qualia Structure Research Project. So the, the idea behind that is it's a sort of new and emerging approach to studying consciousness that holds that uh, a way of understanding, characterizing, and eventually hopefully explaining what consciousness is and how it comes about in the universe is through one, exploring the relationships between experiences themselves, so the phenomenal structure of consciousness, and two, trying to understand the relationship between these phenomenal structures and the neural structures or information structures or physical structures or some sort of structure in the physical world and these experiences, so the neurophenomenal structure. Um, and this time we're going to be uh, touching on a paper called um, A Relational Approach to Consciousness, Categories of Level and Contents of Consciousness by now who's with us here and his co-author Hayato Saigo. Um, and this, this is one of the, the key papers that we wanted to look at during this series. And maybe briefly, um, I might touch on something we spoke about in our first Qualia Structure Journal Club, which is just try to give trying to give a, a definition um, of different philosophical approaches to thinking about conscious experiences and phenomenal consciousness, um, because this contrast might, might be useful for the talk that goes forwards. So on the one hand, when we consider an experience of, um, let's say red, some qualia, some experience, uh, there are those who think that to talk about that kind of experience, we don't need to talk about anything else, that this experience of red is somehow just inherently a non-relational, non-extrinsic phenomenal redness. Uh, whereas others who take a more holistic approach think that to talk about this experience of red, it's helpful or necessary um, to talk about the relational properties between uh, red and other possible experiences one could be having. So this intrinsic, intrinsic approach as opposed to a holistic approach. Um, but that's all the background. So I, again, we'll uh, just mention that this is the paper that we're gonna be looking at. Maybe this is a good point to check we're all on the same page in understanding what I think is the, the core thing that the paper is trying to get across, which is how we can identify the experience of a banana in one circumstance with the experience of something that may or may not be the experience of a banana at the other, in another position in time or space or whatever it is. Um, so as I see it, the, the thing that this paper is trying to get across is the use of the Yonai dilemma, uh, which is a, an, a theorem in category theory and applying it to phenomenal consciousness. Um, and uh, now has a, a, like a two-part tutorial system, which really goes through the details of, of how that can be done. Um, but to, to very simply put it here, I think one way of describing it um, might be to say that what makes the two experiences of the banana the same, or what makes two experiences that may or may not be about bananas, um, both about bananas, is that the similarity between any of those individual experiences and other experiences that one could be having um, are the same. So they have the same set of relational properties. And in this circumstance, uh, what we would say is that the individual experience of a banana um, is part of the category of like possible contents of experience one could be having. Um, and the similarities correspond to the arrows or morphisms or like ways of uh, connecting the relationships between different possible experiences. Now, would you say that's an accurate description of the paper or am I missing elements? I, I would say that's a very good summary. One only thing that I would add is that you said that the similarity has a primary you know, uh, relationship, uh, but and that's exactly correct. But Ideally, we want to extend uh, the way to characterize qualia as a, not, not only a similarity, but other kinds of uh, relations. And uh, yeah, the important thing within this you know, Yone Dilemma is that any kind of a relation that can constitute category should you know, uh, apply to this thing. So you know, it's not restricted in similarity domain. Um, so, Nicolo, do you want to put the first question to now? 
Yeah. Um, well, I guess there are a few questions that uh, might be quite interesting for this project, but I guess uh, uh, let's start from, from the beginning, I guess, uh, like uh, at the very beginning of the paper, um, so you, like you say that the scope of, uh, of this project is somehow to give a sort of direction in, in the study of, of consciousness by defining consciousness uh, in a structural way, in a relational way, right, rather than just a pure definition of, of what consciousness is. Um, I was thinking, um, and then and then you say and then you say that perhaps you can uh, uh, you can pair you can match this uh, this project with IIT right with a theory like IIT and I was thinking uh, perhaps there is a tension there uh, if we interpret IIT as a sort of qualia realism in a sense uh, because qualia normally at least a philo philosopher uh, talk about qualia are supposed to be like intrinsic properties, right? Non-relational uh, non properties. Like uh, the, the, the feeling of, uh, of red is what uh, fixes the content of the red experience, right? Just the feeling of red. So the, my question is this, I guess, just to start, is there like a sort of tension uh, between uh, taking phenomenology seriously and uh, trying to define uh, uh, consciousness in a relational, uh, way or or, or or you don't see it as a sort of tension you can you think you can we can uh, uh, dispense all right so um, it's a bit complicated uh, uh, question so I, I need to probably answer one by one uh, mm -hmm. first uh, um, your question about the tension between uh, phenomenology first or IIT to be more concrete and the approach that I'm uh, proposing, right? Yeah. In, in that sense, I wouldn't say that uh, there's no, uh, there's any tension actually. First of all, uh, like uh, I, I bring this uh, example up to uh, some people, but uh, um, you, you guys also uh, interviewed with Tim Bain, right? A couple of yeah. uh, weeks ago. And uh, if you remember, he talked about you know this you know hypothetical imaginative uh, creature who can only experience red, but nothing else. And that's sort of you know, logically you know imaginable, but you know it doesn't make sense uh, from the point of the IIT the viewpoint because if there is no alternative other than red, then that creature wouldn't experience that thing as red. That's a really fundamental kind of attitude in a axiom of IIT, information axiom, right? It is red because it is among all these possible, you know, color and among the possible other visual features, um, it is in this way, that's why it is color. And in this, it is this way, that's why it is a color of uh, red. So in that sense, you know, uh, experience, uh, explaining or defining a qualia from this relational point of view is completely consistent with uh, IIT's approach. That's my first answer. So, yep. so you, that you have like, a, you can have an experience if you have some sort of uh, discriminatory capacities. Right. If you if you can like put a boundary between something and something else, right? If, if mm -hmm. you do that, you don't have experience at all. Is that a, the starting point? Okay, can you say that again? Like if you if you can't really draw a boundary between a something and something else, then you 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 are not experiencing anything. Is that the idea? Or you can't experience anything? I I, I would say so. Uh... Sure. And it doesn't actually also make sense uh, for that thing to experience it in that way. Hmm. Uh, you know, um, like experiencing something on the right side makes only sense because there is other position, no, uh, uh, namely not on the right, right? 
in contrast to the left, because it's here, that's why you see it on right side. If there is only one point that you can experience and they talk about right or left, it doesn't make sense. Well, maybe we should come back to this point because I think it's a little technical, um, but I am interested as to how this approach would distinguish, well, what it would say about uh, whether there's a difference between having a minimal phenomenal experience of like only one possible experience um, and just having no experience at all. Like what, what a theoretical system would be like if it's indeed possible, if it could only have one experience and whether it would make sense to talk about the difference between that and no experiences at all. But I, before, before getting to that sort of question, I, I guess what I wanted to, to check mm -hmm. was my understanding of the paper overall. So as I see it, as described in its introduction, um, the, the goal of the paper and the approach generally is that if we assume some sort of identity theory of consciousness. So we assume um, something like IIT, where we're trying to draw some identity between like physical structures or neural structures or some abstraction of physical structures and neural structures. Um, uh, IIT does that in essentially one step where it just immediately identifies information structures with um, phenomenal experience. Um, whereas what now and Hayato say we should be doing um, is to break this down into multiple steps where we try and on the one hand characterize the phenomenology and on the other hand we can go about characterizing the physical structures or neural structures or their abstractions and then try and draw links between the two of them. Um, so I guess the, the first question I, I would say is um, do you have a sense of whether this approach will only work for um, like a, an identity theory of consciousness or do you think this would still be useful if we took a functionalist approach or a higher order approach or for any particular theory of consciousness? Um, like what, I guess, what are the, the theoretical presuppositions of using this sort of approach, if any? Okay, so you, you again said um, multiple things and uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> I, I'll have to un un unpack a little bit. Uh, first of all, we are not uh, assuming anything like identity theory. That's okay. very important, and also you know it's very distinct from other types of the approach as a sort of empirical approach to the consciousness. And I also don't understand the contrast between identity theory with respect to other theories such as functionalist theory or higher order theory. They, they are not the, sort of the comparable kinds uh, to me. So identity theory, by that to, to be more precise. Uh, According to IIT or Tononi's you know, uh, formulation is that uh, there is a uh, one set of, or you know, one particular phenomenal uh, state, right? That corresponds to one particular mix, uh, maximally irreducible conceptual structure. And this mapping is the very, very simple kind of, you know, formulation is that the one to one. Like if you find a one particular experience, then you will find a one particular mix. And that relation is automatic and it's kind of co-determination or co-occurrence. It's not like co this one causes this or this one causes mm -hmm. that. In that sense, I think an IIT is talking about identity theory, right? And uh, the theoretical supposition uh, on uh, uh, pre presumption of uh, that you know we are taking is that you know especially partly uh especially because you know hayato's um background is physics especially modern uh physics uh, including you know general relativity and uh, re uh and also in the quantum uh theory the quantum gravity the most modern type of the uh you know physics are also you know consistent with this idea of uh, structurism or ontic structurism or relationalism and that that is sort of you know implicit but you know behind this kind of you know approach of uh in uh not not uh starting from identity point to point kind of you know uh, correspondence but rather including what to consider as a point is a part of the theory you know, depending on how you view it, you know, let's say 
And I, I think, you know, Nicola, I, I might have commented on your thesis about this, but uh, even, let's say, you know, you, if you are conscious of banana, it can contain many, many different kinds of a banana, right? And if you consider that cloud of banana experience as one point, then that would also con uh, you know, correspond to cloud of many different kinds of you know, things. So what to consider as, a, as a, something equivalent or equivalent class or same depends on the resolution of your theory. And you can't make it too finely in the end. Because if you do that, then the theory actually collapses. Like, you know, um, you know uh, yeah, maybe I, I wouldn't go farther from here. Can I, can I follow up on, uh, on this? I think this is an important point uh, mm. on the type of correspondence then. So you say there is a, a cloud of, uh, of experiences. So like uh, uh, I have an experience of a banana right now, then I have an experience of a different banana, then I have another experience of a completely different banana. And, but yeah, I guess the point is that uh, um, so each specific experience of a banana, I guess, will map on a, a specific uh, informational structure, but then there must be like a cloud uh, of uh, informational structures. And then the point is that, uh, I guess, the, the category theory project is finding the, corresponding, the correspondence between clouds then instead of the specific um, a specific banana, specific uh, informational structure? Yes and no. It, it's a bit more subtle, uh, I'll say. So if you think about, you know, um, the case of banana, right? What to consider as, you know, um, particular experience uh, depends on what to ignore in a sense. Right? For example, do you care about, you know, the number of the bananas? Or do you care the position of the banana? Or do you care the size of the banana? Do you care about the background of the bananas? And many, many things. Right? And then if you define the banana experience as or including all of this, then correspondingly, the, you know, corresponding uh, mix will be different. And the way to specify one particular experience through the words is always already impossible because of this problem. You know, Tononi sometimes uh, write it as a Stokoria in a broad sense, right? In his uh, paper with Balduzzi 2009, you know, one moment of entire experience as such, that's the only way to specify one experience. But when you go into this narrow sense definition of a career, like, you know, sense of banana or, you know, experience of a banana, then you need to, you know, discard many, many different kinds of specifics and then to uh, uh, extract one particular essence. And that blurs in the end, the specificity of the corresponding, you know, uh, mix. It's a sort of a duality between the aspects of the thing versus you know thing itself object itself if you have a many many aspects then you can specify object very clearly but if you have an app uh, if you want to define object very abstractly then um, you know you you can't specify all the aspects it's like sort of you know uncertainty principle kind of situation yeah but uh, yeah i guess the only uh, no, I think I understand that. I, I okay. guess the, the, uh, the only part that is a bit uh, unclear to me is that uh, the, like, um, even if we want to focus only on the visual experience of, of a banana, right? Um, we must find somehow a core, like a core structure that, that tells me mm -hmm. that like the visual experience of a banana now mm -hmm. is a visual experience of the same type of thing mm -hmm. that I saw mm -hmm. in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there must be some sort of a, a core that might be defined uh, of informational structure that depends on the yeah. visual stimulus. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah. That, that that might be intrinsic to that stimulus, right? That might not depend on like uh, how I feel or what I'm hearing or or anything like that, right? That, that's that structure that categorizes the stimulus banana as banana might be intrinsic. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So th there are two aspects to what you said already, right? One is that uh, uh, because it becomes super, you know, useless when you try to be extremely specific about, you know, particular banana in a particular context, we want to abstract away and then we want to talk about, you know, some kind of general banananess. Mm. Right, I agree with that. And then once you do that, then you can't expect that the mix to be also, you know, specific, extremely specific, because this part is already, you know, blurry. Okay. Okay. That that's the first part. Part. But then the second part that you said is that that if that's the case, then there is a there must be intrinsic banananess in the banana itself. Yeah. That part I um. Uh, I agree to some extent, but it's a matter of the degree to uh, to some extent as well. Because, for example, you know, if you if you talk about the banana as the fruit, you know, in front of you, and then uh, something that you know that you can uh, eat and things like that. So uh, the aspect of the banana includes things that are edible, smells, and so on. is completely different from the banana picture on the you know wall, artistic banana or some kind of concept of a banana, or you know, a visual presentation of a banana that you know that it's not a banana, or imagine banana and so on. And every, every different kind of you know, experience of banana variant will have a different kind of you know, uh, uh, mix because it has a sort of a contextual you know, uh, difference and so on. But having said that, I also agree that there should be some kind of core neural mechanism and the core information structure that is likely to be matching with, you know, this blurry notion of the banana in some sense. But that's very different from the ideal identity itself. Okay. I will have a series of practical questions about how that can be used and, and whether we can actually apply this approach faithfully to the scientific study of consciousness. Um, but before I ask those questions, do you have any theoretical questions you wanted to ask Nicolo about this approach? Um, I have some questions about the level of uh, consciousness, uh, the, the, so on the consciousness meter part. So if uh, your question is more uh, Related to the part that we have just discussed, maybe you should go. No, for you go for it first. Uh, okay, so uh, like um, at some point uh, in the paper, I think you say um, that you we can somehow construct or at least represent a consciousness meter uh, through the, the the project of uh, category theory. So if if I understand correctly. The idea first is to come up with a, a pre-order of uh, levels of consciousness, right? Um, and then try to map this pre-order onto a category that might be, I don't know, natural numbers perhaps or something like that. Um, and, and then uh, I think you say uh, that uh, there might be like a, so the there there must be like a functorial relation between uh, like mm -hmm. the, the category of the level of a conscious mm -hmm. onto the category that you call uh, D I think mm -hmm. uh, uh, we don't necessarily need a functorial relation that goes backwards from D to uh, the category. Mm -hmm. Of, of, uh, of consciousness, if I understand correct. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, I actually have uh, what two questions. The, the, first que the first question is uh, exactly how do we characterize the category of levels? So what is the criterion that we use uh, to, 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 to come up with these levels? And, uh, and the second question is uh, why shouldn't be a problem the fact that we can't uh, uh, go back from uh, 
the category, let's say, of natural number to the levels of consciousness. That that seems to that seems to be actually a problem for the the project of uh, coming up with a consciousness meter because otherwise, I mean, well, like when you have a thermometer, right, to measure your fever, you, you want to know that if you have like forty two degrees, you better go to the hospital, right? So you can go back from from the the the, the category of number to the category of uh, how severe the the, the the, the fever is right so like if you can yeah perhaps is a, is a bit of a problem for the consciousness meter so i would say you know that that's actually a really good question <laughs> and also i, I wanted to actually uh, even potentially you know, write a separate paper out, uh, on this uh by you know pointing out this only thing because you know there are lots of you know i in my opinion it's a miss uh, understanding and also you know misconception about the level of consciousness in the field mm -hmm. so what what we are having issue is that uh, let's say if you have a category of a uh, level of consciousness and then there what we know phenomenologically or what everybody agrees with is that the full wakefulness is higher than anesthetized mm -hmm. and also Full awakeness is higher than deep sleep and also a uh, vegetative state, right? Mm -hmm. And then correspondingly, if you have a natural number of you know, wakefulness to let's say 100, and then if anesthesia has, let's say, you know, 50, and then deep sleep has maybe 70, and the vegetative state of um, 10, uh, 10 or something like that, then you automatically assume that this one um, is higher than 10, meaning that the deep sleep is higher than the vegetative state and so on. But what, what I'm having an issue is that the, where does this thing come from? Mm. And I, I say that there is no guarantee that you know, we can actually have this comparison at all from our phenomenal experience or our you know first person you know report at least right now right and then but 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 creating this kind of functorial relationship is totally fine as long as you are yeah you, know, you are not saying that you know um what, what we are establishing is the inference from this side of the things the numbers especially with this relationship also guarantees the existence of this thing. Okay, okay. Okay. I mean, you know, we can construct a functor for going from right to the left by, uh, even if there is no arrow here, by projecting this arrow into, you know, collapsing into something like, you know, uh, this may be a little bit uh, difficult to imagine, but uh, what, mostly uh, easy kind of a uh, way to collapse it is a hundred to, uh, you know, corresponding to wake and then 50, 70, 10, all collapsing to, you know, vegetative state. This kind of mapping guarantees that all these, you know, arrows maps onto either this arrow or self arrow here. So this this is an existence of the functor. It's probably not the kind of functor that you are imagining, right? Because you you think that a kind of useful functor uh, that you are imagining is that the something that maps fifty to anesthesia and the seventy to deep sleep and ten to this. That's that's too narrow from a category theory perspective. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. That's kind of what I, I had in mind because you know, um, like if you can map from uh, from you know fifty or better, both fifty, seventy, ten can go to the same. So that would be a many to one mapping. Yeah. Uh, we we, we uh, how can we use it? Like, what, what is the the, the, so, the okay? Power? So that that's roughly speaking. Roughly speaking the kind of the model or concept called you know loss of consciousness as one thing right 
and then mm -hmm. map everything into instead of each of these things, but rather going to somewhere here where we acknowledge the fact that, you know, under the loss of consciousness, we just can't compare among them. Okay. Okay. That corresponds to this kind of thing. Okay. Uh, can I add a, a slightly different question? I mean, it is related, but for example, like in the, in the wakefulness case, in the wake uh, case, um, can we say that perhaps there are some level even within that uh, global mm -hmm. Like for example, you know, if you are, if your level of arousal is pretty high, I don't know, you are watching like an action movie, you are super intense, mm -hmm. like full attention, uh, compared to when you are a bit of maybe bored, you are like maybe doing a very boring task. You might say that that your level of consciousness is not that high as a, as a when you uh, are watching. Oh, that, action movie. Yeah. Okay. That's also another uh, point that I want to also make, which I. Um, uh, you know, I imagine that would be actual purview of this, you know, kind of paper, hypothetical paper. <laughs> what you're talking about is, in a sense, you know, within the category of the wakefulness, there are many different kind of objects or states. Let's say, you know, this is like now, and then this is like, you know, now with uh, plus, you know, coffee and so on. <laughs> yeah. Right? And yeah. then this could be like, you know, now plus uh you know uh, maybe two hours later without any you know break yeah <laughs> and then you are automatically assuming that you know this one is higher than this this one is higher than this and this one is you know even higher than this and so on yeah. uh, something like uh this type of the relation is the one that you are assuming yeah okay well wh where does it come from that's my question you know I don't think everybody agrees with the, you know, th there's obvious kind of phenomenal difference between now without coffee and then now plus coffee. You know, to say something like that, you are automatically assuming some kind of the measure of the arousal or some kind of, you know, preconceptual kind of, you know, assumption that uh, this must be bigger, but not purely from the phenomenological point of view. Well, th there is a like blood pressure, heartbeat, or whatever you know. No, well, I, I guess there is a distinction, like in how it feels phenomenologically. I guess the the the, the, the disagreement in is uh, how to categorize that distinction in, in these terms, in plus more or in this level, or if it's just like a, or if we can order through only one criteria or uh, through like multiple dimensions, but like. There seems to be like from the, the phenomenological perspectives, there seems to be a, a distinction in being alert and, you know, like allocating attention to what you are doing from when you are a bit bored, uh, you know, uh, and uh, I don't know that, the, and it seems to, it seems to make sense, but it, I mean, it, it is true that uh, saying that one is higher than the other is purely kind of based on intuition or I mean it, you know it's exactly what you said probably you know many people's you know assumption implicit assumption is that you know this one is larger than here and then this is less than here precisely because of you know your assumption that maybe some kind of reaction task reaction time task performance or some kind of attention demanding task is worse here compared to here Therefore, you say that attention is lower here compared to here, and you are assuming that the attention, overall level of attention is exactly the same, or we can substitute with the level of consciousness kind of, you know, concept. What I'm saying is that, you know, that's not so, you know, straightforwardly, you know, acceptable among the field of the neuroscientists, or, you know, even within the everyday uh, uh, people compared to, the difference of the arrows in terms of level of consciousness com uh, when you talk about wake uh, versus anesthesia, wake versus deep sleep, and so on. I, I suspect there might be other ways of characterizing these things. So for example, intuitively for me, and I, I don't have this formalized in any way, but like a rough way I can think about maybe sort of um, ordering 
what it is to have different levels of consciousness um, would just mm -hmm. be by the set of like possible contents that I could be having during an experience. So if I'm in a vegetative state, there's nothing. If I'm in sleep, there's a restricted set of possible contents. If I'm normally awake, then there's a typical set. But maybe if I'm super jazzed on like coffee, like I'm really attent and like I can really have like a lot of different finely grained different contents that I have. Um, so I, I guess I'm just suggesting maybe there are like possible ways that one could define and order these, even if there's no acceptance in the field at the moment of, of ways to do right. it. So I, I totally agree with that. And that's in a kind of the approach or proposition that IIT is making in a sense, right? Like number of the distinguishable, you know, states that is under the, you know, unified, you know, state of consciousness that corresponds to the level of consciousness, quantity of consciousness and the quality of consciousness. That's, you know, the way initially kind of proposed. Right now, you know, it's not super clear uh, if you think about it very carefully. But anyway, if we think about some kind of, you know, number as a level of consciousness, then we can start to quantify something like that. I agree. Then the empirical question now becomes whether this kind of, you know, intuition actually holds or not. And I have a strong doubt that this is incorrect. So, so maybe that, that's a good way of jumping into a series of practical questions that I actually have um, about using this approach. So the first thing that I noted actually while, while you were drawing these diagrams now is we sort of sneakily jumped between on the previous slide, um, you had wakefulness as a particular object within the category of levels of consciousness. And then on the second slide, you had the set, you, you were using wakefulness as a category, and then there were individual objects within that, which was like now in a normal state, now with coffee and other sorts of things. I, I guess what that indicates for me is it seems very difficult to try and come up with um, categories of consciousness or categories of phenomenal consciousness in a principled or consistent way. And I know in your paper, you make very clear that you talk about the contents of consciousness and levels of consciousness as possible categories, but those aren't the only way that it has to be done. But I, I guess my question is, do you think there'll ever be any sort of principled way to describe like what are the correct categories of consciousness? Or is that even just a bad way of thinking about it? I generally think that, you know, it's not the correct way to think about uh, the usage of a category theory. Category theory is very good at articulating your viewpoint, right? So if you are interested in this, you know, within the wake states and then you want to make a, uh, you know, ordering within that, then it makes sense to, you know, first start with a category of the, you know, wakefulness and then to talk about the ordering. And if you want to talk more broadly about the level of consciousness in general, then these kind of minor differences may be you know, abstracted as a you know, grouped and the wakefulness and then compare with other states, right? And this really you know, relates to the first thing that I talked about in the beginning. The more you become actually very, very vague about the thing that you are going to talk about, then you can be actually more precise about your statement. It's a, it's a generally true kind of statement in mathematics. At least, you know, as, as far as I can understand from, you know, uh, Saigo and also, you know, my general kind of understanding of mathematics, right? If you are very, very vague about, you know, particular wakefulness, wakefulness, then if you are really vague about any kind of loss of consciousness, then the uh, distinctive difference between the, those two states become more and more clear, right? But if you talk really about the fine difference of a particular level of, you know, like my state in every day around 2 p.m. versus my state at 2 p.m. with coffee, I really don't know whether there is any kind of, you know, from the sort of, you know, standard deviation plus mean kind of, you know, thing, you know, it's mostly overlapping in many ways, and you can't make a precise kind of a relational you know, statement about it. Yeah, I, I guess just to clarify. So I guess mm. I was thinking more about uh, contents of consciousness when I was thinking of trying mm. to define categories. So you mentioned before there were 
the idea of like broad quails, like the entire experience at once, as opposed to right. narrower senses of it. So my entire visual field, as opposed to a particular patch of my visual right. field, as opposed to a particular object, as opposed to maybe the right. particular color of that object. And right. we can go further right. still down to like the hue of that object or the saturation, or maybe there's even more precise qualia that I can't articulate, but that I do experience. And I guess what you're saying is you don't expect there to be a, a natural level of those things that is like the category that we would think about when describing phenomenal consciousness. It's just that we can just use category theory to describe whatever element of, uh, like qualia at whatever level we are interested in describing. So it's again, sort of a similar kind of answer, but you know, the more you, you are kind of a broad in defining what the level of query you want to talk about, the more precise you can talk about that relationship. And if you go into deeper, the deeper, 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 and the very specific, then you start to lose the uh, specific, you know, relations. So it's really up to the way, you know, pra both practically, empirically, and also um, in theory, I, I would say. But a theoretical part is uh, just a prediction, right? Like, you know, if I want to be extremely specific about my particular experience, then the only way to do it is that, you know, right now at this point, and then compared to what, you know, the moment after or before, I, my brain is already different. So I can't to be, you know, precisely compare that with uh, in terms of a mix in a slightly different moment. So including that, you know, it's a really, related to uh, also some, some kind of, you know, idea co uh, called, you know, renormalization theory in a ph physics, or maybe coarse graining, you know, you give us, you know, bound of uh, the statement that you want to make. And then if it's, you know, uh, you know, coarse enough with this level of the description, then that's a, you know, level that you need. That's the level that you want. But if you want to go further, then, you know, you need to change the resolution of the theory and the topic. Even in physics, that's the case. And then why, why not? It's not the case for the, you know, consciousness. So there's no generic, you know, once and for all kind of a category that is super useful for consciousness, I would say. Yeah, I guess just as this is more of a comment, um, I guess there's a tension then if, if we're unable to, to find obvious categories or obvious um, ways of, of connecting, I guess what people would naively expect consciousness to be like, or what a more like straightforward, transparent view of consciousness is, um, it becomes harder to try and relate um, this particular approach to other uh, either philosophical or practical approaches to studying consciousness, which I guess is why I'm looking to see if there's like neat ways we can we can map this approach onto other ways of thinking about or studying consciousness. But I, I don't have a well-developed point on that. I just wanted to flag Are, it. Uh, about that, do, do you think that's the case really? Uh, in my view, uh, what category theory also explicitly you know, brings to the field is that, you know, asking for specification of the viewpoint resolution and then context of the theory that we are talking about or phenomena that we are talking about. So, you know, often it is these three things are done by vague sort of, uh, not, not really vague, but the definition of the conscious, uh, consciousness or definition or description of the experimental facts or, you know, uh, talked about, you know, papers, categories and so on. But, let's say you, if you are talking about level of consciousness, then that's this particular type of category. And then what's the uh, perspective? You know, perspective is from my viewpoint, you know, what I can actually confirm as lower or higher, that's my definition. And then I can start to think about the arrows. And then you realize that, oh, from this perspective, I have no way to actually confirm the existence of the arrow between the deeply anesthetized state versus, you know, vegetative states, because both of them, I just can't experience to make a comparison, right? So making this in you know, a context viewpoint and also topic to be 
explicitly is what the category theory is, you know, bringing to this new field. Yeah, maybe maybe on that, just to, before I give Nicolo a chance to ask some more questions, um, when when using this category theory theoretic approach for doing actual science of consciousness, so doing experiments in the real world, um, I just want to check whether you would agree uh, that these assumptions apply. Um, so if we're wanting to characterize the, the experience of a subject using these approaches, we'd have to assume, like obviously, one, that the subject is conscious. We'd have to assume, two, that the differences in relationships that they report, whether that's similarity or some other sort of uh, distinguishing relationship, reliably tracks some sort of change in the subject's phenomenology. And also, we'd have to assume that constancy in let's say their similarity judgments track some sort of constancy in their phenomenology. Um, would you agree all those assumptions apply if we're, if we're wanting to use this practically? So the idea being that if we had a person, we'd have to assume the person's conscious. We'd have to assume that if they said two things were similar in every possible circumstance, that they were the same experience. And if they said two things were in any way different, then they weren't the same experience. I think you to, uh, mentioned about three issues, but uh, and, uh, my vague impression is the second and third is unclear uh, if it holds, but uh, probably it's better to go one by one. Okay. So what, what was the first issue again? Well, the first is uh, we have, the first is like, if we want to use this approach practically, we presumably have to assume we are asking for similarity relations from a, a subject that we assume is conscious ahead of time. This doesn't let us skip that assumption. Um, like we can't just characterize the similarity relationships that a, a robot gives us or an alien gives us. And um, because it can describe similarity relationships at all, we already know it's conscious, right? True, but uh, the kind of the analysis that we are doing doesn't really you know, require that uh, thing that generates similarity or um, any kind of relationship report to be conscious, I would say. I mean, uh, yeah. is it necessary to assume that it has to be conscious? Well, if we're trying to study consciousness, I, I'm just checking this doesn't let us shortcut the assumption that the, the, what we're obtaining reports from is conscious. Nicola, does that make sense to you? It, it reminds me of uh, John Searle's uh, uh, objection to the NCC project, right? That he says, like, uh, when you say that, uh, you know, FFA is the correlate of a conscious perception of a face, right? You're assuming that uh, the subject is conscious, right? <laughs> is a uh, mm. uh, feature conscious. And that's why you, you're assuming that the FFA is the correlate of consciousness, right? Yeah. So, Just a so detector. I, I... I, I kind of understand where you're coming from. So in general, I think um, the type of the argument where, you know, you say that, you know, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? Each, uh, each of, um, you know, a statement and then build up the logic kind of thing uh, is not really appropriate in many ways. Uh, partly because uh, each of the statement can only um, check for the certain aspect of the things and then you know as a holistic kind of assessment of what you want to achieve in the end uh it may not be really you know uh appropriate you know it's sort of related to what we were talking about you know your paper right in the uh, in the other day so yeah i mean uh, it, it's probably reasonable to assume a weaker version of that but you know i don't go probably too far about that and then the second one is a reliability right yeah, essentially we have to assume that the reports we're getting of either constancy and similarity or, or constancy in relationships or changes in relationships are reliably tracking the actual phenomenology itself of the, the subject. About the reliability, I'm not so, uh, again, this is, uh, again, you know, is it good to have, but it's not really critical to have, uh, or, you know, it's also the matter of the degree to some extent. And uh, if it's not reliable in itself, it, it gives us some kind of you know, structure of the relation and its relation, uh, its report as well. So 
we are thinking of, um, I, I mean, I already wrote that version of the manuscript in Japanese, and then um, we are probably going to work on the English version in a couple of months. But uh, there, I, I'm thinking of, you know, Aquaria or experienced Percy and uh, reported content as two separate, you know, categories, right? Yeah. And then there, what I'm thinking is that, you know, experience is there, and then under what particular specific, you know, experience, or, you know, maybe grouping uh, particular sets of experience into, you know, one, you know, group. And then from that, you can make a report. But a report is always, you know, capturing only part of the reality. So based on the collection of reports, if you try to reconstruct the experience, then it's never going to be, you know, identical here, right? It's a, within the category of the actual and also imagined experience, there's always a displacement if you go from there to here to here, right? This kind of uh, situation is called adjunction, but it's not the case that you know, if I see, for example, sparring letter, you know, display, and then I make a report that, you know, I saw a bunch of uh, alphabet LTDG or whatever. And then based on that, if you try to reconstruct what I saw, it's not going to be like, you know, picture of the mountain or picture of the river or a picture of, you know, some kind of movies or whatever. It's a variant of the sparring letter array like phenomenology, which is not far from what I exactly saw, right? So, you know, there is, it's not exactly the same, but it's within reasonably similar. So that again, uh, the resolution, it depends on the resolution of the theory that you want to make. And in that sense, if the subject is, for example, you know, um, highly, you know, uh, very se severely limited in attention or, you know, memory, then his case, you know, going back, going to the report, to reconstruction may be very, very bad. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, his report is completely meaningless or report has to be exactly reliable. It's more like, you know, uh, to characterize the way, uh, nature of the relationship with the report reliability. About the third one, consistency, that's actually much more subtle and also important kind of thing, because in the history of the philosophy, right, uh, the opposition against uh, Gestalt and the, the, the atomic theory of consciousness by Wundt is uh, attacking this aspect, right? I don't, I, I'm not the expert in this kind of history of philosophy, so Nikol may know much better. Yeah, but, uh, you know, Gestalt, yeah, Gestalt people and so on are really concerned about, you know, if you completely understand what the red is and what the shape is, combining those two, can we really reliably build up all the you know, conscious experience? And that's a sort of the related, uh, you know, related to this consistency or uh, independence of, uh, you know, contextual effect or something like that. But that's, again, you know, um, more of the empirical question to me. And uh, it's co contextual and uh, dependency and the perspective dependency is one uh, of the uh, characteristic property of consciousness. And in particular, in some uh, kind of experience, I think. Not all of them. Okay. I think we, we are broadly in agreement about what the assumptions are and probably to okay. get into the technical details would be a little bit laborious. Um, we don't have very much time left, so I guess, Nicolo, do you have any final questions? Otherwise, I do have one other question, but I'll let you go. Oh, go, go for it, go for it. Okay, so um, now the example you give in the paper that sort of motivates this entire approach um, and gives some sort of um, uh, argument for, for using this approach, this category theoretic approach, is the idea that um, it seems to be the case that when we think about colors and the relationships between colors, that that describes our color experience. And it's very counterintuitive to imagine someone who just loses the experience of an individual color. So mm. it's really weird to imagine keeping all of our relationships between color experiences and just like losing red or losing green. Or alternatively, it's really weird to imagine um, somebody who has the same color experiences 
but as a different set of similarity relationships. So someone for whom mm -hmm. like red and pink are really different from each other and like yellow and purple are like really similar to each other. Um, but this is a sort of a, it's not a formal proof of the theory. It's just a, a motivation for this sort of approach. Um, so I guess my last question is, how would you respond if we did find a subject uh, that said that like they just lost the experience of red, where like it didn't make sense to them anymore. This experience of red was gone. The rest of their color experiences were there. The similarity relationships were there. Would that actually um, uh, sort of hinder this theory in any way, hinder your approach in any way, push you back towards the like more intrinsic perspective that others argue for? Um, or would you have some other explanation? I don't know. I mean, I, I have to think about the uh, implication when we really encounter such a narrow patient, first of all. So I don't know. But uh, if I think about this question in a different modality, then I may be able to start to think about it more uh, clearly. Like, it corresponds roughly to uh, the case where um, you know, one particular part of the uh, body, you know, here you don't have a pain experience or something like that, or you just don't feel anything around uh, shoulder or something like that. And that that is fine, right? But uh, why, why it's fine with this, you know, kind of a body experience versus not the local property of this, you know, visual experience is probably related to the way that, you know, we are, our experience is generated by respective neural mechanism, right? You know, uh, in the case of the somatic sensation of this particular location, it's clustered in the neurons, and then that that cluster of the neurons, is, uh, you know, informational structure is generating that. So, losing that thing, you know, all all the way will correspond to you know losing something altogether, and so on. But uh, so that that's a sort of a response to the second part. And the first part, I uh, you said something which I don't necessarily agree, which is that uh, if two persons are experiencing exactly the same way, like Nicolo and, you know, Ariel, but the similarity rating are, are very different, that's totally fine with me. Because it's similarity rating, you know, that, that's uh, probably better described in our recent, you know, uh, enriched category paper. Uh, maybe we cut it out in the end, but uh, anyway. So thinking about, you know, Korea and then repo as a different category and then transfer from this category to this report category as a functor. If you think about that way, right? As a Korea structure of, you know, Nicola's color stru uh, Korea structure and the Ariel color structure, maybe they are very, very similar at this level, extremity, but the functor to make it report may be completely different. Different rules result in different kind of similarity re response. And that's totally fine with me. That, that, that means that the, the, the similarity ratings is a judgment about experience, it's not the experience itself, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, so it's a cognitive judgment. So that's why you can have a- Cognitive or not, that, that's- Unclear. I mean, uh, if you if you kind of assume that you know cognitive um, implies some kind of symbolic representation or something like that, then I would say, no, no, mm. not that, yeah, okay, not okay. quite. Yeah, okay, okay, right. So we've hit our time limit. Unless there are any other further points, I will stop the recording here. I'm good. Okay.